Well, this morning, uh, Pastor Chet is going to continue uh, our series of For the Good of the Realm. Uh, but before he comes up, I just want to share a few thoughts with you. Uh, and so I'm going to take this verse. We don't have it for you on the screen, but I want you to hear, hear and listen. It says this in first, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 17 and 18. It says, Now the Lord is the Spirit. Everyone say that with me. The Lord, the Lord is the Spirit. The Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom or there is liberty. You're in the place of liberty. In other words, you don't, you don't need to think you're in bondage. You don't need to be in bondage anymore. You don't need to be held back because in the Spirit of the Lord, there is freedom. There is liberty. Amen? But we all... With an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. And are being transformed Amen. into the same image Amen. from glory to glory, just as from the Lord. Amen. Do you hear what we're saying? There, there's the transformation that's taking place. And it says we are beholding. Not when we behold. We are beholding. That means God's presence, His glory, His beauty, His honor, His grace is always surrounding us and we are in the, in the place of beholding. We are already beholding. Now when you behold, you know, when you behold yourself in a mirror... For example, you behold yourself in a mirror, you see what you look like. And sometimes you might not be that impressed. Right? <laughs> you wake up and you go in the mirror and you're like, oh, oh, who, who, who changed the mirror? No, no one changed it. You've changed. But when we see something in the mirror and we immediately want to say, oh, I, I need to fix something here. I need to correct something here. I need to better something here. Um, that's what we do in the normal Shame on us if we see something that needs to be changed and don't do it. Walk away from the mirror knowing we need to change in some way, knowing we need, that image needs to be improved, but we never do anything about it. Then when we go out, someone sees and they say, hey, look at this guy. You know, he, he, he didn't even comb his hair. He didn't even, you know, he didn't even get, it, get herself. She don't, she don't have any makeup on. <laughs> she don't, well, whatever, God forbid. But you know, when we're looking at Jesus, when we're seeing and beholding God, when he is the captivating focus of our eyes, when he's the thing that matters in our purview, in our sight, in our, in our expanse, in our panoramic vision. In other words, we see it as he surrounds us. His kingdom is all that really matters. Yes, we live here on the earth, but his realm is over the earth. Jesus wasn't saying his kingdom isn't here. He was saying his kingdom is here. But what he was saying was his kingdom is not of the world. My kingdom is not of this world. He said if it was, we would fight for it. But his kingdom was not of the world. It surrounds the world. It's bigger than the world. It's greater than the world. And Jesus constantly beheld the realm of God. He beheld the kingdom of God. You and I need to have that same understanding, that same mindset. God doesn't stay here in the building when we leave. He's not standing here at the pulpit going, Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> See you when you get back next week. Or if you come on Wednesday, I'll, I'll be here. No, God, don't dwell in temples made by human hands. You don't dwell in buildings anymore. When you go out, he goes out with you. <laughs> when you go in the store, he's there with you. When you get, go to work, he's there with you. When you lay your head and press your pillow at night, he's there with you. The realm surrounds you. You're always part of the realm. And when you have a focus like that, when you are aware of it, when the light has turned on, that's why we sang that song years and years ago. I saw the light, I saw the light. No more darkness and no more night. What are we talking about? We're talking about the light of the realm, the kingdom, the kingdom of God. Amen? Are you listening? Amen. Having that perspective and having that vision in front of you. Now let me give you another verse. 
Uh, verse 17 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says this, Therefore we do not lose heart, starting in verse 16, I'm sorry, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. How is our inner man being renewed? By the realm. By our observance of the realm, by our activity in the realm, by the power of the realm. It's working in and through us, the realm of God. Verse 17, for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond comparison. Put that in English. In other words, because the things that we are dealing with, which causes the decay of the human body, the, the, the struggle of the human life, the battles you and I face on a daily basis, the afflictions we experience, the troubles we experience, is working in us because of the realm. It is working in us in eternal glory that will never, ever be destroyed and never be faded. In other words, it's worth what you're going through. Something's happening for a reason. And there are experiences that you're part of. And it's all the working of God, the working of the realm in your life. Embrace that. Don't run from it. Embrace those things. And it'll start that transforming process of the man looking in the mirror and seeing Jesus or seeing the realm of God, seeing the glory of God. It begins to transform you and change you. And then he says this, For while we look at the things which are seen, whatever that might be, physical, the physical realm, the emotional realm, the mental realm, while we're looking at things that we see, the experiences we're in, the trials we face, the mountains we must climb, while we're looking at the things that are seen, but at the things which are not seen, we do not we, in other words, he's saying, we're, we're, we're looking at the wrong thing. We're paying attention to things that we see all the time, knowing we have to experience these things. But when we pay great attention to that and not paying attention to the realm that surrounds us or the power of God or the kingdom of God or the glory of God that surrounds us, something is being miscued here. We get our eyes and our affections and our things on the earth. We get moved by what we see. We get moved by what we feel, and, it, and, and often it can move us out of place in a sense of we're not right, we're not feeling right, we're not living right, we're not walking right, we're not walking according to the realm, we're walking according to the things that we see. Years ago we used to have a saying, I'm not moved by what I see, feel, or hear, but only by what the Word of God says about me. And in our particular case, what the realm of God speaks of for better for me. For the good of the realm I live. For the good of the realm I move. While we look not at the things which are surrounding us and we, which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are all temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. The realm of God that you and I belong to, you don't see with your natural eyes. You're not aware with your natural understanding. It is, a, it is a spiritual sight and a spiritual understanding, but it's more real than the things that are seen. Are you ready? Don't wait for the day you get to heaven before you realize how real this thing is. Realize it now. Realize the realm of God surrounds us now realize the reality of God in every aspect is now I was talking to my daughter earlier we were talking about the value of serving and I was I was telling her that that what she does when she's running the cafe I said you may think that that's menial or it doesn't add up to much it's not much to it but in reality Jesus made a comment to make sure that nothing is left out concerning our serving in the realm. And he said, if you so much as give someone a cup of cold water, we might, we might add in, or a cup of coffee, in my name, you by in no means, according to him, will lose your reward. By no means. Great is your reward. 
What a difference that that makes. Are you listening? What a difference that makes. So we have that reality, that perspective. And I said, when you serve, I said, you know, people come in from, from the outside. Sometimes they are bothered. Sometimes they've had a rough week. Sometimes um, they're feeling down. And they're to church. They're hoping that when they get to church, they get lifted up, built up. They experience something. And I said, when you give them a cup of coffee or a pastry or a donut and you serve them, and you serve them with a smile, and you serve them with a how do you do, how are you? And, you, and you give that, you can pull someone right out of a pit just by your, your, your demeanor, just by your presentation. Remember, we serve the realm. We're not serving people or serving ourselves. We serve the realm. And in our serving of the realm, we serve God's people in every aspect. Amen? I'm going to leave you with that, and I'm going to invite Pastor Chet McCord to come and give us a good teaching. Amen? Amen. All right. Amen. God bless you. Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We're going to be talking today about for the good of the realm or the kingdom of God, and I'm going to call this, for the good of the realm, dominion. The realm, as you know, is the same as the kingdom, or it's a field of study, or a domain. Some of you are into computers, know what a domain is on your computer. It's an area of activity and interest. What we're talking about is living, for us, in the realm of of God. We're talking about living in relationship with God and allowing him to guide and empower us to do what he desires. It is a relationship where both parties have a role to play. Just like my head has all the insight and authority and dominion to control my body, but if my legs don't operate, the things don't get done. If you, if you are a person who has some infirmity or you're crippled in some way, you can see it's a lot difficult. It's very difficult to get things done. But I want you to know that God is a relationship being. He exists in relationship Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and always has. He created almost all living things as male and female, and only being made and the only being made in God God's image exists in male and female form. God said in Genesis two eighteen, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper who is right for him. God did not want us to be alone. He wanted us in relationship, not only with our husband and wife, but with him. Amen. <clears throat> Men and women are designed to live and function as one. In relationship, just like the three persons of the Holy Spirit, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are one. They live in relationship as one God. God, without question, is a relationship being, and the whole history of the scriptures are of God working with and through men and women to accomplish his purpose. God worked through Moses to deliver the nation of Israel. He worked through King David to unite the kingdom. He worked through prophets of old, Isaiah, for example, in Isaiah 6, 8 said, Then I heard the Lord's voice saying, Who can I send? Who can I send? Who will go for us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? So I said, Here I am. Send me. That's a good attitude. That should be our attitude. And... and God sent him. God used him. 
Why did God say to Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 37 where we're talking about this valley of dry bones? God could have just said, bones, come, come together. Do what you're going to do. Flesh, come on you. Air, come on you. No, he didn't do that. He said to the Son of Man, prophesy to these dry bones. He was speaking to Ezekiel. And what did Ezekiel say in verse 17? So I prophesied and I was, as I was commanded. And while I prophesied, there was a noise and a rattling and the bones came together. Bone to bone. Every time I read that verse, chills go up and down my spine. God had a man speak and he worked through him. Yes, God works through men. You and I. For us in the new covenant or the new contract with God, we are literally in Christ. He is in us and we are in Him if you are a believer. He is the head and we are parts of His body. Just check out the Bible, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians. It's all over the place. Man is, in relation, is a relationship being too with the pattern, the husband and wife, a family, a tribe, a people, a nation, even if you're living alone, you're not married, for example. You fit into those categories someplace and live in relationship. If you're a believer, you should be in a relationship in a church. It's a family. It's a, it's a unit that God has ordained. It's why in church is so important. Why does God choose to work through men and women to accomplish his purpose? I believe it goes back to the very beginning. So I want you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. This is the very beginning of the creation and what God was doing in the creation. It's the first chapter of the Revelation I hear pages turning, that's a beautiful sound. You don't hear it anymore, hardly. They seem to quiet down, so here I'll go. Then God said, let us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let us make human beings in our image and likeness. We are made in the image of God. No other creature is. We are made in the image of God. God said, don't build any other images. He already has images that he made. And that is us. And let them rule. Ooh. Let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the tame animals, over all the earth, and over all the small crawling animals on the earth. If you turn over to Psalms chapter 8, David speaking by the Holy Spirit, he asks God, why are, why are people even important to you? God, listen to that. David asked that question. Why are people important to you, God? You made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You put them in charge Everything you made, you put all things under their control. That's pretty powerful stuff. This is called dominion. God gave man dominion over the earth to be his representative. You represent God as a believer. He did not give them the earth, but he put them in charge of guarding and keeping it for him. It is called stewardship. 
God owns it, and man has authority over it. However, in so doing, listen to this, in so doing, God limited himself to work through man on the earth. Did you hear that? God limited himself to work through man on the earth. God is not like us. When he gives something, he does not take it back just because we do not treat it right. He doesn't take it back. Just like he gave you gifts, if you don't use them, he doesn't take them back. They're still there. Man rebelled against God and in so doing gave much of his authority over to the God of this world, the devil. That is why when Jesus was being tempted in Luke 4, remember Jesus went into the wilderness and he was there and fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Then the enemy tempted him and he took him to a high place and showed him all the kingdoms or realms of this world. And then he said, I will give you all these kingdoms and all their power and glory. So who was in charge of it then? The enemy. I will give that all to you. It has been given to me. Do you see that? The devil's of power and authority was given to him, and I can give it to anyone I wish. If you worship me, he said to Jesus, then it will all be yours. Of course, Jesus didn't buy that. He said and worshiped and served God alone. But he gave the devil... Who gave the devil dominion? Only one had the dominion, and that was man. The devil got his dominion from man. God gave man dominion and limited himself to working through man. Do you doubt that? then why did God have to come to become a man to win it back? Think about that. He had to be a man to win back the dominion. He had to be a man to fulfill the law. He had to be a man to pay the price for sin and death. It had to be a man. Why? Because that's who dominion was given to. You doubt it, then why did God come, have to come to be a man and win it back? Just the eternal Son of God came and was born a woman and became a man-God, fully God and fully man. And he demonstrated God's goodness and power by allowing the Father to live through him in exercising man's dominion. How did he do that, Chet? Well, he healed the sick. He raised the dead. He cast out demons. He calmed the storm. He cursed the fig tree. He turned water into wine. That's a man with dominion. He forgave sin. But he had to die to pay the price. Not just for a few sins, for all sin. And fulfill the requirements of the law to win back for us the dominion we were originally given. That's an important transaction. He won back for us the dominion that we gave away. The realm of God that we're talking about is a relationship between God and believers where we are we live united in Christ and he works through us in much the same way that the father worked through Jesus the pattern we see in the new testament our new contract is that he is the head and we are members gifted and called each one of you are gifted and called by God to be a particular part of his body. 
which he will use to accomplish his purpose on earth. Not just to accomplish what you desire, but what he desires. Your head decides what your body does and your parts follow. It should be the same with God and us, or it should be. To put it another way, Jesus said in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I remain in you, they produce much fruit. Who is he talking about? They produce much fruit. He said, if, you, if any remain in me, I will remain in them. So he's talking about us. We're the fruit bearers. We're the branches. We're the ones that bear the fruit. If we don't do what we're supposed to do, people don't get healed. They don't get delivered. They don't get, you know, prayers answered. We have a part to play in this whole realm. You need to realize this realm is a partnership with God. I can do nothing without him, and he is limited without men and women to work with. He's limited. If I do something, if I heal somebody, I don't have any power to heal. But if he tells me to go over and lay hands on somebody and speak to that cancer, I should do it because he works through me. I can't take any credit for it, but he does it through me. This revelation should dramatically change how you think about prayer, this dominion revelation. Why do you think he taught us to ask for his kingdom to come? Or for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's how he told us to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why do you instruct us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. And lead us not into temptation and deliver us from the devil. Are these things not the will of a good God? Yet we are instructed to pray about everything. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, let your request be known to God. Why? Because God gave man dominion on the earth and he does not take it back. He needs our prayers to release him to do what he wants to do. Did you hear that? He needs our prayers to release him to do what he wants to do. The reality is, brother and sister, he wants you healed more than you want to be healed. He wants you restored more than you want to be restored. But he needs faith. Listen to James chapter 5, verse 16. When a believing person prays, a believing person prays, great things happen. Elijah, this is an example of a believing person praying. Elijah was a, was a human being just like us. And he prayed that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Then Elijah prayed again, and the rain came down from the sky, and the land produced crops again. Note, it is a believing person. James says very clearly in chapter 1, if you're double-minded, if you doubt and believe, and you doubt and you believe, you get nothing from God. He said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast to the sea, and it will obey you. What is he saying? Faith, even if it's a little bitty bit in the kingdom of God, 
If it's pure, and it's without doubt and fear, it will move mountains. It will move mountains. Now, Elijah, it says, is a man like us. This is the New Testament. This is the New Covenant. It's saying, we're like Elijah, or we should be. I would like to transition for a second from recognizing our role of having dominion and belie- as believers and the importance of prayer to Jesus ministering while he was on earth. I specifically want to talk about how he was teaching his disciples and ultimately us to function in this new realm. You can be assured how things work in the realm or the kingdom of God is not how they work in the natural world. They are different. They are very different. Just give you a couple of examples. He says his strength, God's strength, is made perfect in weakness. <laughs> that's, not, that's not like the world is. His strength is made perfect in weakness. When the centurion sent him word, Jesus was coming to heal his servant. He sent word, I'm not even worthy that you should come into my house. How many of you would feel that? But he said, I'm not even worthy you come to my house. He was displaying his weakness, his complete dependence on the grace of God. That's what he was manifesting. But he says, I know if you say the word, my servant will be healed. Jesus said, I've never seen such faith. Not in the house of Israel. Faith begins by knowing you got nothing to please God with except his grace to you. But that's enough to move mountains. Amen. That's the kingdom of God. It says, if you want to be a leader, you must become a servant of all. Not the biggest dog, not the toughest guy, not the, any of the things the world measures. He, you become a servant of all. It is almost totally opposite how the world operates. And the world, remember, is under the control of the enemy. This involves a transformation of the way we think to begin thinking like God thinks. It is, as Pastor Dan was talking about just before I spoke, being transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Romans chapter 12, 2, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. Dan mentioned that. It is learning to live in relationship and partnership with God in His realm. That's what he wants us to do. So how are we to proceed? What are we supposed to do, Chet? Well, the scriptures are a good starting place to give us a clear and safe understanding of how God thinks and let us be assured we're quoting scripture on different places. If you're If you're quoting scripture about every situation and circumstance and you can you can quote all kinds of scripture at certain problems and situations that is not evidence of a renewed mind I'm sorry it's not a renewed mind is impossible without divine encounter In other words, the printed word should lead us to the person of Jesus. John 5, 39 says, and Jesus is speaking to the religious leaders, you study carefully the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life. 
they do in fact tell about me. Contrary to what you think, the scriptures give you eternal life. The scriptures really lead you to me. But you refuse to come to me to have that life. That's the problem. Any revelation from Scripture does not, that does not lead you to Jesus and a relationship with Him only makes you more religious so that you act more like the Pharisee than a follower. Those Pharisees and followers, they focused on other people instead of themselves. And they were often focusing on what other people were doing wrong and what was go- instead of what was going on in their thoughts and minds and hearts and actions, particularly when nobody else was looking. When you are reading Scripture and something catches your attention, listen to this, this is important. When you're reading Scripture and something catches your attention or sort of speaks to you, That is an invitation to encounter Jesus personally. It is a signpost. Oh, I'm on the right track. I'm going to the right place. It's an invitation for you to come and interact with Jesus. That encounter normally does not just happen automatically. It requires you to pursue him for it to get from your intellect into your heart. It requires a pursuit. You can know when it is in your heart. You can know when it's in your heart when you start living that way as the normal way you are. You think that way automatically. So, why do you say you have to pursue him, Chet? Because that's been my experience. The revelation I got from God regarding grace happened after I had been pursuing God for months, studying Romans chapter 6 and chapter 7 and trying to figure out, what is it you're trying to show me? I couldn't figure it out. And then I prayed one night, and I basically said, I don't know what else to do if, it's, if you're going to show me what it is, you're going to have to show me yourself. That night, he showed me. That night, he answered my prayer. That night, he gave me something that completely changed my life. On the inside, not the outside. And it's because I pursued him. Sometimes it takes God a long time to work instantaneously it does it does Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 13 about all the gifts and how they should be operating in the church he tells us in 1 Corinthians 13 the next chapter all about love what love is and how it functions one is a revelation of the gift and how the body functions The other is a revelation of the gift of God in love and what love is. And then in verse 14 of the, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 14, verse 1, the next chapter, look at what he says. You should seek after love. Pursue it. Go after it. It's not enough just to know what it means. It's not enough to be able to quote it. You need to encounter it for yourself. When I encountered love from God, I felt so unworthy of that love. Yet I was overwhelmed with it. There was no doubt about it. I said, if I can be forgiven all my sins... How do I hold anything against anybody? If you are holding something about someone else, you can't forgive them. 
you don't understand God's love for you. Because once you do, you can't hold it. It's overwhelming. It took a personal encounter for that to go from here to here. This revelation <clears throat> that we're talking about, and he also said in that same verse, you should truly want to have the spiritual gifts. In other words, you know you have a calling. You know that God chose you. You know you have a play, part to play in the body of Christ because he tells us over and over again in the scriptures. You need to pursue him. You need to go after that. You need to allow God to give you revelation with regard to that whole thing. The revelation of how the kingdom of God works leads us to the pursuit of those things which will result at some point in an encounter with Jesus who will make it function in our lives. Matthew chapter 13 verse 44. The kingdom of heaven or the realm of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. One day a man found the treasure and then he hid it in the field. He was so happy that he went and sold everything he had so that he could own the field and buy it. That's called pursuing God. That's called going after the pearl of great price. He went and sold everything he had to get it. Oh, that we would do that with love, that we would do that with the gifts, that we would do that with being a servant of Christ, we would change. And so would this church. And so would this area. And so would all kinds of people that we go around. Because Jesus would be manifesting himself through us to the world. And he would be going about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. I would like to give an example of how Jesus was always trying to teach his disciples to live and function in the realm of God. I want you to turn with me to Mark chapter 4. It's the story of Jesus calming the storm. Jesus has been teaching his disciples about planting God's word in good ground. Not ground that's hard. It's not ground that's stony. It's not ground that's full of weeds. It's good ground. And then he talks to them about the power of the mustard seed faith. And then he decides to go across the lake. And then we look at Mark chapter 4, verse 35. That evening Jesus came to his followers. Let's go across the lake. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him in the boat just as he was. Now I want you to note, let us go across the lake. Let us go across the lake. That was Jesus' instruction, right? Let us go across the lake. So they went with other boats, and then a strong wind came and it was so strong that the disciples began to be terrified. These were men, many of these men were fishermen. They knew what it was to be in the water. They knew what it was to, you know, man boats and deal with things. They weren't novices out there. They were experienced. But it was so bad, it says that they were terrified. And they, were, they thought they were about to drown and die. Now Jesus... <laughs> Jesus was asleep on a cushion at the back of the boat. So they woke him up and said, Teacher, don't you care we're drowning? <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes we say some weird things to God. If you are angry with God, I, I just, 
That is beyond my comprehension. God never does anything wrong. I'm sorry. If you are angry with God, you do not have an understanding of who God is. He wants only good all the time. Just look at Jesus. So Jesus, what did Jesus do? Well, you can imagine him getting up, get up, stands up in the boat. He says to the wind and the waves, quiet, be still. And everything went completely calm. Now, can't you just imagine Jesus standing in the boat? He's probably wet. The boat was rocking. Now it's just like on a lake. The wind is gone. The water's still. And he slowly turns around and looks at these disciples all huddled up, dripping water. They're like, And listen to what he says. Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? That's pretty powerful stuff. Now let's step back just a second and look at this as if it happened today in our time. So the disciples went to Jesus. So that's like prayer, right? They went to Jesus. That's what we do. We go to Jesus. We pray. Jesus comes and solves our problem, right? He answers our prayer. We're so happy. We're, we're delighted. We're, praise God! And then he says to us, why were you so afraid? Don't you have any faith? When we have a problem, we go to Jesus. He's, what is he trying to teach us and them through this example? You see, listen now, you see when God authorizes you to do something, go to the other side. When he authorizes you to do something, he always gives you the ability and the authority and the power to do it. He always backs you up if you move in faith and not in fear and doubt. If God tells you to go over and lay hands on somebody, he gives you that ability to do what he's asking you to do. He never lets you go out there and do it alone. He always gives you that power. We normally call God into the midst of the problems we've created and want him to come in and clean up the mess. When what he wants to do is partner or co-labor with us to work through those problems to solve them. Him working through us instead of him just bailing us out. Amen? Amen. That is why God is trying to teach the disciples. They should, they should have been speaking. The disciples should have been speaking to the storm. Instead, they were overwhelmed with fear while Jesus was overwhelmed with peace. So much so that he slept. If God gives you a word, it's him working through you. It's not you. But you need to do it in faith. If God asks you to do something and share in the body, it's because he wants to build up the body. He wants to strengthen the body. He wants it to be a cooperative unit. He wants his body to function as a unit. We're disabled, brothers and sisters. We got parts of our body that aren't functioning at all. It, they need to function. 
I need them to function. I need the body because I need help. I do. I know that. But let me assure you that as Jesus was sleeping in the back of the boat, you can't give what you don't have. If you want the love of God to flow through you, you need to experience the love of God. If you want the forgiveness of God to flow through you, you need to know his forgiveness yourself. Amen. Amen. And if you want peace to flow out of you to any kind of situation and circumstance, that peace needs to be in here. And it's not going to be because your circumstances are all good. It's because you're trusting in the rock that will not move and that will always be there and always love you and you meet his requirements because Jesus met them for you. And it's your faith in that that should give you peace. Amen. Jesus spoke peace to the storm and it obeyed him because he was full of peace. God wants to co-labor with us in the same way he co-labored with Jesus, the Son of Man. He wants to do the same things that Jesus did when he was on the earth. He wants to work through us to do those same things. That is why he called the church into being. That is why we are the body of Christ. It's why he is the head. It's why Jesus is still here on earth in bodily form, in the form of church, the only organization that God ordained I love all these parachurch organizations and all that, but the church, brothers and sisters, is where the action is. And the enemy has done a magnificent job in disarming the church and making it a performance event. It should be, what is Jesus going to do today in our midst? So please, brothers and sisters, pursue him for the good of the realm. Amen? Amen. God bless you.